All right, so let's get us started. Um, so we're talking about low-level vision, and we're trying to understand the biological system so that we can decide how to develop artificial systems or computer vision systems that emulate what the biological vision system does, right? And remember, you should be extremely familiar by now with this model of the brain, right? This is a sagittal view of the brain, side view, with the eyeball here, right? So I observe the world um, that I have here. Maybe I have, you know, a vase with a flower, right? And that is projected invertedly, right, on the back of the retina. We've seen this in 5460. And then as we've said here, this goes and gets processed first in the retina, then in the LGN and other subcortical areas, and then it goes to V1, and then to V2, and so on, right? Vision one, vision two. And then there is this ventral pathway that goes through the temporal lobe, which is this lobe right here, right? Um, all the way to the very frontal part, uh, which is called IT, right? Okay, so this is the model. Um, and what we wanted to do is to try to emulate what the human visual system does, but um, with algorithms, right? Computer algorithms, that is. Um, and to do that, we need to mathematically formulate uh, what the brain does. And when, what, in order to do that, we look at the neuroscience data, right? The neuroscience research. And neuroscience, neuroscientists have spent years painstakingly recording from all these different cells along this pathway to try to understand what that pathway does, right? And we'll get to different results of different parts of this pathway. But in 5460, the introduction to image processing and computer vision, we talk quite a bit about what's in the retina, right? The cones, the rods, how you detect um, edges, uh, how you represent color, and so on. Uh, if you haven't taken that course, you can, again, go to the YouTube videos and just watch it there, right? Um, and then from there, um, it gets processed in the LGN and V1. And as we said, um, from the early works of uh, Hubble and Weasel, we know that um, these cells respond to changes of intensity of illumination, right? Basically edges, right? So when we go from a lighter area to a darker area or vice versa, right? There is a flash. And so the first hypothesis that we made, and that's a hypothesis, right? Has to be very stated very clearly. Hypothesis that one of the tasks, if not the task of these early visual areas is to detect edges and maybe other unions because after um, the early areas where the cells respond to changes in illumination, then there are cells on top of that that process these changes to create more complex unions, right? So we talk about union detection. And so these are hypotheses that we've made and we've derived algorithms, mathematical equations that can be implemented in a computer that actually emulate that, right? That emulate edge detection, that emulate uh, union detection and so on. So that's our first uh, hypothesis that led us to the space scale theory because one of the problems that we're facing is, well, if we're gonna match edges from one image to another image or from an internal model to an image, then there are gonna be changes of scale, uh, translation, rotation, we'll get to all of that, right? That we have to deal with. So that led us to uh, space scale theory and that led us then to SIFT, right? And SIFT and SURF and all these other methods are, uh, algorithms to detect points of interest in the image. So this is our very first block of results that we got from this uh, model of how the ventral pathway in human vision or mammalian visual system works, okay? Is that clear? Now the second one was, well, maybe this detection of edges and unions and points of interest is just an illusion to us when we, when we um, look at the response of the self with an electrode and we detect what happens, right? Because when you do that, what happens is that, um, so neuroscientists, what they will do, they'll come here and insert, insert an electrode to the brain of um, the, usually some uh, mammal, usually monkeys these days, um, although Hubble and Weasel work with cats, 
Um, so they'll put an electrode here in the brain, right? And then they can read from the outside with an oscilloscope or some more modern uh, apparatus. You can read the, uh, the firing of, of these cells, right, of these networks. And then what do you do? Well, you change the visual stimulus, right? And then what Hubble and Wiesel did is when they changed the visual stimulus, so they put a, a, a ray of light uh, that was moving up and down. When it passed through the visual area of that cell, the cell fired. But when it didn't, it didn't, right? And then they showed that there are cells around it, the surrounding cells, that when these are active and the center cells is inactive, then the top cells activate and so on and so forth, right? But the problem with that view is that you are giving an interpretation of your experimental observations. And that interpretation may be wrong, right? It may be right, but it may be wrong as well. Um, so the other hypothesis that we studied is that this is not exactly what's going on, but what's going on is that um, we're trying to extract statistics from the image. We're trying to describe the original image that, that we observe from the world, or that's created from the world. We try to extract ex statistics that are useful later on in mid-level vision and high-level vision to interpret what we're looking at, okay? Um, and that led us to two solutions. One was um, using linear least squares, right? Which led us to the classical eigenvalue decomposition, led us to finding these eigenvectors, right? And that method, we'll get more details of that. It's called principal components analysis, or PCA for short. And the reason it's called principal components analysis is because you find the principal components, meaning the eigenvectors, right? that describes the data most accurately, right? And when we show that if you take the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, meaning you do a principal component analysis of windows of naturalist scenes, what you obtain are basis vectors, the eigenvectors that you obtain, these principal components, uh, actually represent statistics of the image. That looks some of them like averages, standard deviations, um, maybe some Gaussians or derivative of Gaussians, right? Um, and in fact, they look very similar. If you look really closely, they look very similar to the DCT basis that we discussed in 5460, right? That are derived from Fourier analysis. So maybe that's what the brain is doing, just extracting the statistics, right? And then another option that we explore within that realm is, well, so note that in PCA, what we really do, right, in linear least squares or that PCA method that we derived, what we did is um, we represent the information of each feature as a feature space. So if I have P features, then that represent or that is represented in a usually the real domain might be the complex uh, but for now the real domain of p dimensions right the number of features and then here each observation in our case each observation corresponds to a window of a naturalist scene right the small window of an image of a naturalist scene right and when i do this what I find is that, there, uh, that these two original features are highly correlated in that direction, right? So there's this eigenvector here, right? That defines that dimensionality of the space. And that defines this uh, one dimensional in that case, so let's say in general Q dimensional subspace, right? With Q typically much, much smaller than P, right? And that defines the important features that describe the, or that can um, define every single natural image that we create. And that's why this is also related to the DCT basis, right? Because what, why did we introduce the DCT basis in 5460? To do image compression, right? So we're looking for some basis vectors so that when I transmit an image, say over the internet, right? Or a long video on Netflix, or whatever other platform that you're using, I don't want to transmit every single pixel of every single image. That would be too costly, right? So what you do is you tra transmit the coefficients 
of that space with that, those basis vectors, right? And that's really cheap. And that's what it's done. And PCA is just another way to get to that. And the results that you get, obviously, are very similar to the DCT basis. And there's actually an underlying reason for this that we don't have time to cover, but I'll just mention it here. And that is, is that if you assume that your data points are distributed as a Gaussian distribution, then you can actually prove, formally prove, that the PC uh, representation is the optimal representation according to uh, the least of squares uh, criterion. Okay? So, again, if everything is Gaussian, then PCA, as with respect to the least square criterion, uh, is optimal. Okay? And this is very useful because that actually can be then shown to be equivalent to or similar to what the DCT basis does. Okay? All right, so uh, that was the first uh, solution. And then the other solution, which is related to another method that we, um, that we did not talk about here in this course, but that I cover in detail in, mach in the machine learning class. So you can either take the machine learning class if you're interested next year, or you can watch the YouTube videos again, um, uh, which is ICA, Independent Components Analysis. And this is a way of finding uh, nonlinear correlations, right? So PCA finds linear correlations, ICA finds nonlinear correlations, but the method that we derive, which is related to ICA, it's just a way of finding a sparse basis vectors. So you're trying to find basis vectors instead of these eigenvectors here, you're trying to find basis vectors that are uh, whose coefficients, sorry, um, so uh, find basis vectors whose coefficients um, are mostly zeros. Right? And to do that, we use the classical model in signal processing, A equals S plus N, right? So X, our observation, remember, S the sources, right? This is the real source in the world. A, a mixing matrix, and N, some noise that usually is assumed to be Gaussian noise, maybe even um, a unit um, zero mean unit noise, right? Unit variance noise. And then we showed that you can derive a method to a criterion, right, to find these sources. And then when you find the sources, these sources, these basis vectors that define these sources, actually look like Gabor filters, right? And we're not surprised now that we're finding Gabor filters because this is what neuroscience is finding, right? They're finding cells that respond as if they were Gabor filters. So maybe the cells are doing H detection and fiducial point detection, or maybe they are just trying to find these basis vectors in a way to represent the image in a way that is useful to them, right? Okay, I have one more uh, model to go through, and that'll be the last one for low-level vision, okay? And that has to do with interpreting biological neural networks uh, and modeling them as artificial neural networks, right? And see where that takes us. Now, before we can, so, so now I'm gonna do one of these parentheses that I keep doing, right? So usually I, define the problem, right? We talk about hypothesis, and then I need to solve or to model, mathematically model, uh, that new uh, idea that I have described. But to do that, I need some tools that I don't have, right? So I, let me define the tools. So now make a parenthesis, introduce a new type of method, and then when we finish defining the method, we're gonna use that method to show how to model artificial neural networks, okay? So far, so good? All right. So before we can get there, um, let's talk about um, graphical models. And you'll see that I've posted a lot of papers in Canvas uh, for you to look at that, uh, as always, <laughs> as I do for every single thing uh, that we cover in class. 
um, that actually uh, give details of everything that I'm going to talk about today, okay, and in our next lecture. So, um, this work goes uh, back to the uh, 60s, 70s, and especially the 80s, um, early 80s, um, late 70s, early 80s, when people started uh, discussing um, how to more accurately describe what this biological system is doing. Okay? And the way um, some people did this, or what became most famous, is you start with an image. Actually, let me make this probably larger. You start with an image, okay? So that's your image. Okay? So far, so good. Now, I have to say, this is not as close to biology as we could have it, right? Because our image in the back of the retina is not like a photo camera, right? It doesn't have, the pixels are not of the same size, they're not equally distributed, right? In our retina, you remember from 5460 that there is much, much more resolution at the center of the image and less resolution as you go away. You don't have color vision at the center of the retina. You don't have color vision in the periphery, I know. You think that you're seeing color in the periphery, but no, you don't because there are no color sensors there, right? I mean, there are a few, but the number is just so tiny. It's just basically useless, right? But this is information that your brain fills in, right? So we talk about all these things in 5460. So obviously that's not exactly what's going on in biological systems, but with that caveat, let's start with an image that a photo camera can take, okay? And then what we're going to do, we're going to try to <coughs> model um, this process that I described here in LGN and V1, V2. And what happens is that every cell in these early areas of visual cortex actually looks into a small tiny area of the, area of the retina, right, of the image in the retina. So let's find that the small area in the retina maybe as this area right here, okay? So there are some cells in V1 that are processing information that come only from this small area in the retina. And I define this as my classical window. It could be a square, it could be a circle, it doesn't matter, right? Um, in my uh, image. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to generate multiple images. Like this. Where each image corresponds to some computations, or even better, each pixel in that image correspond to some computations performed on that area, okay? Just some computations. We'll get to which computations are important, right? But here there is some function h, let's say, that it's apply, or g, maybe g better, uh, that it's apply to these pixels to get me to that other, to this final value, right? So as always, I'm gonna have g of x, x is the input of the pixels in that image, right? Uh, and this is going to be g of x equals y, and y is that value of that pixel. Um, and here let's call it g1, because then if I have um, multiple generations of images, maybe let's call it k, um, then I'm going to have g1 is going to give me an image, g2 is going to give me another image, gk is going to give me another image, right? So for this area, I'm going to obtain this pixel, for another area, maybe this area right here, um, that's going to give me the value of another pixel right here. <coughs> Meaning that for that every pixel here corresponds to a window in the original image. You see how this works? So it's exactly the same as linear filters that we have been using, right? Linear filters, what do they do? They scan a window through the image, that's what the convolution does, right? So I scan a uh, window through the image, building this convolution, and then for each position of the window, it gives me a result 
or a pixel value in another resulting image, right? That's the result of a, field, of a linear filter. So that's what we're going to do, right? We're going to use a functional mapping that's going to be given by some, um, at some point by some linear filter, right? That's going to give me uh, all these different images. Now, when I use specific functional mapping G1, I'm going to obtain this image. When I use G2, I'm going to obtain another image. When I'm going to use G3, another image, I have to say GK, OK? And every time I do this, I'm going to obtain more images. So that tries to emulate what the biological system does. The biological system looks at this small area and generates a new, a new, um, a new representation in the early visual cortex. Another area, another point of the representation, and so on. And it does this over and over and over and over again. Okay. Now, after this is done in early visual cortex, what happens is V2 does something similar. It looks at an area of V1, and it creates another representation. And another area of V1 creates another representation. Another area of V1, it creates another representation, and so on, right? And that's this over and over and again. So in order to emulate this, what we can now do is we can generate even more images, right? So from here, we could generate, say, more images by doing the same operation. I'm going to take a region of this new image, and I'm going to create a new a function, maybe h in this case. Uh, and it's going to give me a result here. And this hr, uh, it's going to give me a new pixel. Uh, and then for another area around here, I'm going to obtain a different pixel right, of the new images. You see how this works? Right? And so then this gives you a new representation here. Now I could do this for, so this big block here is so only for that image. I could do this for every other block, right? For every other image and obtain a new block here, right? Or I could also do another block where I now have images that actually combine information from multiple images or even from multiple blocks, right? And we can start defining structures like this. But to do that, we're going to use some mathematics that are very powerful, are called graphs, <coughs> right? So let's define what a graph is first. And then these graphs are going to allow us to define this more formally in a way that it's easy to derive a mathematical equation that we can then work with. OK? All right. So let's see. So let's just start with uh, some basic definitions. Let's define what a graph actually is. A graph G of VE is a set of, uh, is given by uh, two sets, a set of vertices or nodes Um, v, let's call it, actually that's a set, not a vector. So capital V, V1 through Vn. And the corresponding connections Uh, they're usually called the edges, given by capital E, the set 
of E11, E12, all the way to E1N. Those would be the edges that connect node one, node or vertex one with one, one with two, one with three, up to one with N. And then two with one, two with two, and so on, up to two N, right? And all the way until you get to the last one, NN, right? This huge set. So, if you will, for simplicity, you can say where EIJ is the edge between VI and VJ, right? It's more, more general. So we'll usually use um, the ordinal of E as uh, the number of edges, the cardinality, excuse me, not the ordinal, the cardinality of E, the number of edges uh, of our graph, right? Graph G V E, right? And same. V, it's the number of nodes. Okay. Now, there are very different types of graphs depending on how we define the vertices and the edges, especially the edges. So the edges, uh, in some cases, may just be binary values, zeros or ones, right? So uh, binary edges would be that every EIJ is either equal to one, meaning that there is an edge between V, uh, I, and V, J, and zero otherwise, right? If there is no edge between the two. Okay, simple enough. Okay, um, we'll say that an undirected graph is given by a set capital E of uh, edges with the property that EIJ is equal to EJI, okay? So if EIJ is exactly equal to EI, to EIJ is equal to EJI, then we say it's undirected, because it doesn't matter in which direction we go from VI to VJ or VJ to VI, the value is the same, right? And conversely, we can define a directed graph <coughs> um, is given by a set of edges capital E where EIJ is different than EJI for at least some EIJ pair, um, IJ pairs, right? Okay. 
So far so good? Just small number of definitions, right? But we have to know all these definitions in order to talk about neural networks, okay? Because that's how we're going to um, define them using um, graphs, okay? Now, a fully connected graph is a graph G given by um, a set capital E with every single EIJ different than zero. Okay? So all edges exist. So far so good? Um, a click of a graph is a fully connected subset S, capital S, of the vertices capital V. Okay. Now, if a click S is not contained by a larger click, because know that the click could be a subset of a larger click, right? Then that largest click is called a maximal click. Okay? I'm not going to write it down because it's just too obvious, right? Maximal click, the largest. It doesn't have, it's not a subset of a larger click. Right? Okay. Um, you will see clicks represented many times with a capital matrix C, where you have E11, uh, E1K, right? And then EN1, ENK, right? To represent the click. Um, where case uh, here the number of uh, edges in the usually maximal click. Let's work with that. <coughs> um, more definitions that we need. A path between VI and VJ, between two nodes, VI and VJ of my graph, um, let's see, it's a sequence of vertices. It's a sequence of vertices. Connecting these two uh, two nodes. So let's define this as P. The path is V one. Uh, actually, not V one. I'm gonna start at V i, right? V i. Then V one prime, V two prime all the way to some V D prime, right? And then from here to VJ, right? And that means that there has to be an edge that goes from VI to V1 prime, right? And one from V1 prime to V2 prime and so on, right? Okay. So 
So far so good? Yep? No? Yeah, question. Oh, not, for, not necessarily for a click. We'll get to that. We'll get to square matrices. But not for a click, not necessarily, no. Right, if it's an, in, if it's an un, undirected graph, yes. We'll get to all of this. Yeah, when it's directed, when it's undirected. We're mostly with directed graphs, so. We'll, we'll see why this is not always the case, but we'll get there. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so now comes the um, most important definition of them all. A directed a cyclic graph or we're just going to write DAJ generally for short because saying directed the cyclic graph every time is just a little too much. Um, is a directed graph in which no paths from one verti uh, vertex to another vertex will ever revisit a node from VI to some VJ will never revisit a node or a vertex. Okay. So in order for me to go from VI to VJ, I can find paths, right? I always find paths, rather, that never revisit one of these nodes, right? So V1 prime is different than V2 prime and different than V3 prime and different than V4 prime and so on. And V2 prime is different than V3 prime and V4 prime and so on, right? They're all different nodes, okay? Okay, so that's the definition that is really important to us. So I'm just gonna make it clear here that that's what we really need to remember. And then, of course, to understand this, we need to understand the other definitions. Okay. So, um, last one. I'll do just one more. A weighted graph uh, associates weights, or uh, or just let's say real numbers, right? Associates W I J some real number uh, to each. of the edges, EIJ, okay? Such that here, EIJ is now going to be given by some weight, WIJ, which is a real number, okay? Instead of binary numbers. A weighted graph can be directed, can be undirected, right? The same things can be a DAJ, uh, DAJ. Uh, we can have a weighted DAJ, we can have a, uh, a binary DAJ, right? So there are all these possible combinations that we'll be working with. 
And one more thing, um, uh, one final definition I liked. I forgot that they needed one more definition. Um, these graphs usually are going to be given, so G of VE um, will generally be represented with uh, an adjacency, so-called adjacency matrix. Uh, let's call it capital, no, I already used E, I don't know, uh, D maybe, capital D, where I have D weights, um, 1, 1, 1, N, N, 1, N, N. Okay? And if it's a binary, then it's E1, 1, E1, N, and so on. So um, the way we describe, this is just a side note, but for you to, a fun note for you to go home with. Um, the notation of graphs and the um, description of graph that we are working with was started um, in the 1700s by a guy that you may remember from 5460, uh, Euler. Remember Euler of the Euler angles? <laughs> uh, same guy this is the one that started uh, defining the idea of graphs. Um, that's uh, this um, amazing uh, mathematicians of, of uh, history. So again, all this started in the 1700s, nothing really too new, right, yet. Okay, any questions before I move on? So now I want to use this to start defining um, or, or modeling rather neural networks, okay? So let's do that. So I'm gonna use these ideas that we have presented here to do the same thing that I was doing here, remember that not so beautiful drawing that I did on the board here with all these connections. Now, I wanna do that, but more formally so I can actually write it in equations. So I'm gonna use this idea of graph to represent them and the ideas of linear least of squares to extend on the way to solve the system. Okay, so ANNs or artificial neural networks. So if we look at the biological system, right, the biological <laughs> system uh, is a combination of cells, right? So if this is the eye here, right, right here, at the very back of the uh, eye, right, at the retina, there's this um, thick layer of cells in here, right? And we've studied this in 5460. So if I unbend this and put it as a line, right, I could see this uh, thick set of uh, of cells, right? And then at the very back, right here, there is the epithelium that you may remember. There's a number uh, of enzymes here that are photosensitive, right? So when the light comes in, they are actually um, uh, kind of a fluorescent, so to speak, for a while. And then the cells that are on top of this uh, epithelium can actually read the image, right? 
Um, so what happens is, so let me draw the epithelium here. This would be similar to our CCD of a camera, right? And then what happens is now we have some roads and cons, right? So roads are usually drawn like this, like almost a square, a rounded square, and cones with the cone at the end, right? And then these cones and rods um, actually are able to read which locations of the image are active and by how much, right? And that constructs the, the image for us, right? Um, so um, once this is done, what happens is, so let me draw a few more, so this continues, right? And then what happens is after that, there are a number of cells in the eye, this is still within the eye, right? There are a number of cells that actually read from a number of local <coughs> cones and rods, right? and process that information somehow, okay? Not 100% sure how exactly, although we have pretty good idea what's going on in the retina and the eye right now. And then after that, there are some other cells that read or interpret what these cells do, right? And this thing continues, and whoops, we're building a structure like this, right? Um, it's more complicated than this. I don't want to give you the impression that it's that simple because there are, for example, horizontal cells here that actually have some uh, lateral uh, processing. We're going to ignore all these details. And we're going to assume that we're always going from bottom to the top, right? Remember the bottom up approach that I mentioned, right? Okay. All right. Now, um, the way these cells process information is very complicated, right? And this is another simplification, huge simplification we're going to make. Uh, we're going to assume that these computations are much simpler, okay? Um, but this is the main structure that we're interested in. And now, in order to define artificial neural networks, we're going to use that basic idea of this structure, okay? And this, remember, as I said, it's called bottom-up approach. And when this is used in neuro, to design, to derive neural networks in computer uh, vision or in machine learning in general, um, you will see it called feed-forward models. And the reason is that this only goes in one direction, right? It feeds forward, it never goes backwards, right? There are no connections that go back, okay? So we're going to define this with directed edges that always point forward like this, okay? Upwards, never backwards, okay? At least for now, right? We'll, we'll get to more complicated models by the end of the course. But for now, we, we're going to make that assumption. So let's um, derive the equations for a feedforward model. Oh, it's wrong today. There we go. So let's start with the very simple one, the, or the most simpler one, um, where I'm going to have nodes x1 to x, let's say capital D, um, that represent the pixels of my image, okay? Okay, now the pixels of my image, no, these are observable, right? These are my observations, as always, remember, I already erased that, but that we had work with that model x equals a s plus n, right? Where these are my observations. This is what I observe, right? 
Okay, same thing here. These are the pixels of my image written as a vector, right? <coughs> so I'm putting them as each of the nodes of a graph. Okay? Now, so this is, um, let me write it down. This is uh, observable. Now, the next thing is I'm going to define a certain number of nodes here and the corresponding connections between the x1 through xd to every other node in that other set of vertices. Okay? Now, note there are no edges between the nodes in that column. And there are no connections between the nodes in that column, nor do I have edges going from that column to that previous one, right? Now, these columns written like this, we're going to call them layers. So a layer is nothing else than a subset of my nodes in my graph, OK? So a layer is a subset of my vertices, right? Right? OK. Now, this um, first layer here, which defines the values of the pixels, is observable. And we're going to call it the input layer. Now, this middle layer here is non-observable, right? That's not my observation. That's going to have to compute that set of S's, basis ba vectors or uh, latent representation that we'll talk about that actually solve some problem, right? So this is non-observable. And it's usually called the hidden layer. And it's called the hidden layer to represent the idea that it's non-observable, right? Okay, so it's hidden to us. And then finally, we have a final layer here. which correspond to our outputs, what we want in our outputs. Okay, so that's the output layer. So I'm gonna give n names to these uh, nodes. So this one, this node X1, this node xd, so x1 through xd are these nodes. This one's going to call it z1 through z, let's see, m, capital M. And the output layers, I'm going to call them y. So let's say y, y1 to yk, OK? y1 through y, yk. Now, another thing that we can do, we can actually add a bias term to this. And the way we can do this is by adding an additional node in this layer. Let's call it x0 that is connected to all of these. Okay. And maybe I can add another one here, z0, that's also connected to all of these. Okay. And that's going to serve me uh, as a bias term. And let me show you what I mean by this, by deriving the equations of that model. Okay. So I'm going to do this right here because it's next to it and it's a little easier. So let's think about this. 
Um, let's talk about ZJ. ZJ is either Z1, Z2, 3, 4, up to M, right? Any of them. What's this equal to? So let's assume that they don't have the bias term yet, right? So what this is equal to is, let's see, this one is whatever this node is times whatever that edge is, okay? Now let's give a name to that edge. Um, let's assume that I'm going to use weights. I could use binary as well, but let's assume that I'm going to use weights. So this would be W11 upper script in parentheses, I'm going to write one here. And this one is going to be one capital M parentheses one. So what this means is the weight that goes from the first note in the first layer to the first note in the second layer, the first note in the first layer, the mth note in the second layer, and that upper script specifies that I'm going from the first note, ask you the first layer to the second layer, right? Let's see if that's clear. If that's clear, what is the weight name for that edge from this node to that node? W, anyone? D, D1, upper script, one, right? And this one would be DM1, right? Very good. How about this other one? This node, this upper node here that goes from Z1 to Y1. What would this be equal to? W11, upper script, two. Very good, right? You got it. And this is 1K, upper script, two, and so on. So, now with that, I can compute my um, xi times wij, right? Uh, excuse me. Uh, and this would be um, uh, one. Yes, thank you. <laughs> right? Because I'm using these weights here. And now I'm going to sum over every possible i, right? I from one to, what did I say? D, right? From one to D, right? Now, what I may want to add is this bias term. Let's see what this does. If I add the bias term, this would be plus <coughs> x zero times w um, uh, zero j one, right? Is that correct? Right? So why anyone can tell me? I uh, will see if we're paying attention in the previous lectures, and if you have taken 5460, it should be trivial. But why do I call this the bias term? Because this equation defines what? Is that a linear or a nonlinear equation? Okay, good. It's a linear equation. And what does it define? What's that? A line, more generally? A plane, a hyperplane, right? It defines a hyperplane, right? So how do I define a hyperplane if I am in, say, three dimensions here, right? And I have a plane, I don't know, let's say here, okay? That plane is given by the distance from the origin to the plane, also called the bias, 
Okay. And it's normal, right? That's how we define a plane, right? And what did we do when we solved linear least squares? Remember we had all these linear equations? So when we equal them to zero, d was equal to zero, right? A homogeneous system, then we didn't have any bias. The plane was at the origin. And we can always rotate the, the plane by changing the normal, right? The solution to our system. But we could not move the plane outside of the origin. That's what the bias did. That's when we add the D, right? So when we did this and we derived the covariance matrix and therefore the eigenvalue decomposition of the covariance matrix, which is called, again, principal components analysis, PCA, it's a method to find that hyperplane, right? So if you model neural networks like this, then you already automatically know of a method that can find the values of the parameters of that network, which is linear list of squares. How would we do that? Here's how we do it. We first define a, what's called a training set, okay? Now, this training set is composed of two sets my set capital X, which correspond to my input values, right? X, X vector, there will be X vector. Each of these XIs now, uh, let me probably put the vector here. These XIs correspond to a vector, it would be I1 through ID, right? Define in that space of the dimensions of the input, right? So far so good? And I have, let's say, n of these, right? So I can write from 1 to n, OK? Or capital N. I'm using capitals, so let's keep it capitals, right? So this is a set of x1, x2, x3, up to xn. Each xi, a vector in d dimensions, meaning an input here, right? So these are the inputs. And I have another set y with the corresponding outputs okay and now these y's here y i's are equal to y i1 all the way to y i k so it's a fine in the real domain of k dimensions right so the training set usually is going to be given as pairs of xi and yi vectors, OK? For i1 through n. This is going to be my training set, meaning I know the value of this, and I know the value of this but I don't know the value of the hidden layer. How do I find everything else, all the parameters, these Ws? I don't know the values of these Ws. I don't know what's going on here, right? So how am I going to find all these values? Zs, I know how to define Z, right? Z is given by this equation. I know x. I know x is 0, but I don't know Ws, right? Well, actually, x0 I may not know, right? <laughs> Right? But so those are the parameters or the unknowns of our system of linear equations. You write this system of linear equations and you solve with linear list of squares, as we've always done, right? And that's it. You find the exact value for the parameters of this neural network model. You see how this works? Too easy, right? I mean, um, it's very cool, but if I did this, what would happen? I would get the exact same result I got with PCA. 
Uh, it's the exact same method. This is actually PCA written as a graphical model. There's nothing different, right? This is exactly what I'm going to find. I'm going to find the hyperplane that best describes my samples x, right? So my samples meaning my training samples. I'm going to find that hyperplane that best describes those samples or that map those f to, uh, to y, right? So here's, let me draw this. Maybe I'll make it clear. I'm, f I'm trying to find these correlations, remember? So let's assume that I can draw this in three dimensions, just because, right? So that plane down here, defined by this, uh, let's call it x i 0 and x i 1, right, would be the two entries of a two-dimensional input vector, right? So every vector's input vector is going to be here somewhere, right, in this space. And this is y. And let's assume y j or y i uh, only has one output, right? So I can draw it in 3D, right? So what I'm looking for, I'm looking for a mapping of this onto this, right? That's a mapping that I'm looking for. And that is my function f that I want to solve, right? So I want to solve f of x equals y. Fortunately, I don't have the function f, right? That's what we're trying to find out. The brain that we kept referring to, right, is processing information here in a way that takes some input x and then processes it to some output y, and it does f of x equals y, right? So I don't know what that f is. That's what I want to find out, right? And that's exactly what I'm trying to do here. Now, with PCA, all I can do is find a linear mapping, right? Meaning a hyperplane in this space that maps from the x dimensions onto the y dimension, right? That's all I can do. There's nothing else. Uh, now, you can think that this is too limiting, and it is, because most relationships between x and y are not going to be a linear. I mean, if they were linear, life would be really simple, right? Oh, yeah, the output y turns out to be just two times the input, 2x. Oh, and the, that'd be nice. <laughs> or 2x plus 1. Let's complicate it a little more. Right? I mean, obviously, it's not going to be the solution, right? Um, so we actually want to complicate this a little more. We want to increase the complexity of that model. And we're going to do that in two ways. Number one, we're going to increase the number of hidden layers. Right now, we only have one. But nothing stops me from having this first hidden layer, then a second hidden layer, then a third with interconnections <coughs> from layer to layer, right? Remember, this is a feedforward model, so only this, the previous layer connects to the next layer, right, consecutively. There are no jumps from that layer to this layer, right? It's one after the other. But I can have as many hidden layers as I want. Now, when you have multiple layers like this, one after the other, hidden layers, that is, we call this a deep neural network. Okay? And that's why people call it deep learning. It means nothing else than there are a number of hidden layers, not just one. But if we, we did that, we'd be more powerful but we would still be linear. We would be piecewise linear. So we'd be able to do nonlinear things because we could do piecewise linear, right? But it'd still be piecewise, right? I cannot completely build a nonlinear machine. Now, to make it even more interesting, what we can do is we can add a, a nonlinear mapping in between. And to do that, what is typically done is to slightly change this equation right here that I have here. Instead of calling it zj, I'm going to call it ij. So I'm just going to copy the same thing. ij is equal to the sum over of i 
of xi w i j plus w zero j, um, and this is for the first layer, right? And then zj is going to be equal to some function, let's call it g, of ij, okay? And now, for example, one of the functions that you could use is the sigmoidal, log the logistic sigmoidal, right? We could use the logistic <coughs> sigmoidal function. that is given as g of a is equal to 1 over 1 plus the exponential function of negative a, right? Okay? And we'll talk, we'll spend a lot of time discussing how many hidden layers, why types of con what type of connections between layer to layer, and what type of nonlinear function we're going to use here, and so on and so forth, right? That's all the details. And then finally, so this would be one, and then finally, if you have more hidden layers, you keep repeating that for each hidden layer. And then finally, your output, yj, is going to be equal to the sum of i of the zi's W i j in our simplified model, this would be a two plus uh, the uh, offset, right? The bias W zero j two. Now the very next thing that, or the very big thing that we now need to address is how are we going to find the parameters of this neural network that we just defined? Because note, if I now introduce a nonlinearity given, say, by the logistic sigmoidal, uh, now this can no longer be solved with linear least squares because that is a nonlinear system of equations, right? So we need to find better ways. So let's uh, maybe just give a few hints of what we're going to do, and we'll finish this uh, next week, okay? Let's see, how are we going to solve that? So our next question is how to train networks, right? So the very first thing we're going to define is the least squares criterion, the classical error criterion that we all know and love by now. So our criterion, remember, is the error function given the parameters w, where now w is the matrix or the, or the vector or the tensor of all the wij's case right, that they have in that graphical model, okay? So you can think about i, j, and k to find the tensor if you want, okay, of all the parameters. Okay, so this is equal to um, the sum. I'm going to leave some space here just to give you a heads up. Um, n from 1 to capital N of y xn given some parameters w minus tn uh, to 2. And here I'm going to add 1 over half because when we start, this is a 2, 1 over 2. And 
The reason I'm doing this is because when I start taking derivatives, right, I want this to cancel out, nothing else. Okay? Just mathematical <laughs> convenience, but nothing uh, to worry about. If you don't want to have it there, that's fine. Um, so remember, these are my parameters. Right? And now here, um, this, is, this specifies the true norm, the Euclidean distance. Right? Or the true norm. And here I have used a slightly different notation, just to confuse you, I guess, um, where um, my training set is given by the pairs xn, tn. Now, the reason I use t is because y is the function that maps to, uh, to the final layer, right? Um, so I have n from 1 to capital N. Okay, oops, okay, I'm out of time. I'll derive this equation uh, in our next lecture, and then we'll see how we can actually solve this uh, with extensions of linear list squares, okay? I'll see you next week, have a great weekend.